Zayden POV Fourth Wing by Bell BB Chapter 4 Bonds I've been laying on my bed for what feels like hours, when there's finally a soft knock on my door in a familiar repetitive pattern that I haven't heard in years. I yank it open and see Liam standing there, a huge grin on his face. Shadows whip out down the corridor, checking he's not been followed, and I motion him inside, leaning back against the door as he walks past me. He clocks the room and whistles, low and impressed. Well, if there was ever a reason to gun for wing leader... He turns back to look at me and I can't help but return his grin, the joy of finally seeing him again filling me up. Not too impressed sharing yours with 150 other cadets, I say, arching a brow. He shrugs and says, beats sharing with your snoring ass. I walk over to him then and pull him into my chest, holding him tight. He's here. He's alive. He thumps my back and says, muffled against my shoulder, I've missed you too, brother. I release him, keeping my hands on his shoulders as I look him up and down. He's put on more muscle since I last saw him. You look good, I say, nodding. Strong. He pulls away from me and returns the look, his eyes sweeping over my arms and chest. You look fucking ridiculous. I throw my head back and laugh. Gods, it feels good to laugh again. Yeah, well, once you're spending all morning on a dragon and all afternoon on the sparring mat, you'll look just as ridiculous too. He shakes his head, but he's smiling and pulls out a chair at the small round table in the corner of the room, leaning back on it so it's balancing on two feet. It's such a Liam thing to do. My chest feels tight. I can't believe he's here. He reaches out and pats the table inviting me to sit down too. So, tell me everything I need to know. So I do. I tell him about battle brief and how to read between the lies the professors prattle, the kind of questions to ask. I tell him about the challenges, to trust no one on the mat, not even his own squad mates. I tell him about the gauntlet, that the time and penalties don't mean shit, it's getting up alive that counts. He looks at me grimly throughout, all laughter and joy slowly draining from his face. It really is a death college, huh? He says finally. Not for us. I'm quick to dispel that fear. We make it through this. He nods, but I can tell he doesn't really believe me, thinking of the four others who we lost the previous two years, the two that died crossing the parapet earlier today. What about the weapon runs? I shake my head. You don't worry about that yet. The rest of us will handle it. You focus on bonding a dragon. Yes, sir, he says, with a tight smile and sarcastic thumbs up. He glances at the clock on my desk and stands suddenly, his chair screeching back across the floor. Shit, I need to get back. I pull him into me one more time and repeat myself like it's an order. We make it. His eyes meet mine and I can tell he's searching for something. I pour the strength of my conviction into my gaze. I'm not afraid. Finally, he nods once and heads to the door before suddenly turning back, a question on his face. Who was the girl you couldn't stop staring at in formation? My stomach twists. Which one? I know who. The small one, silvery hair. She looked weirdly familiar. I sigh, taking a deep breath. Violet Sorengale. His jaw drops. Brennan's little sister. Yeah. I thought she was training to be a scribe. Isn't the whole plan built on her feeding us intelligence in a few years' time? I throw my hands up. Guess we need a new fucking plan. He looks at me puzzled, like he's trying to piece it together. Why is she here? He gestures around us. I run my hands through my hair, rubbing my temples. My best guess is that she's been sent here. Whether it's to spy on us and report back, I don't know yet. Liam's jaw clenches and I can see the decision warring in his eyes. Brennan would want us to protect her. Deep down I know that too. That's why my shadows tracked her along the parapet. Why I risked exposure to move her into my wing. I have absolutely no clue which side of this war she's on, if she even knows there are sides to pick. Either way, 
I need her close to me. She's made a lot of enemies already. I think of her again, her knife hovering perilously close to Barlow's balls, her face calm and furious. And you know as well as I do that a few of the rebellion kids will want her dead. General Sorengale sentenced our parents to death. It will seem oh so poetic for them to kill her daughter in the very place they were sent to die themselves. We can't let that happen. I know, I won't. I put my arm around his shoulder and turn him back towards the door. It's under control, Liam. You just focus on staying alive. He looks back at me, determined to argue, but I stare him down until he nods once. Now fuck off so I can get some sleep, I say, and shove him out the door, my shadows pulling it behind him. I hear him chuckling down the hallway as he heads back to his dorm. I don't sleep, of course. Unless passing out from sheer exhaustion counts, I haven't slept since my father left Aretia to declare the secession six years ago. After a few hours of laying on my bed, considering the Sorengale problem from every different perspective, I am no closer to knowing what she knows and how much she's wrapped up in this. I need more information. It's not even dawn as I cross the courtyard to the records building, thickening the night's darkness along the walls to keep me cloaked and hidden. By the time the sun is up, I know everything records can tell you about a person. Born in July, she's the third child of General Lilith Sorengale. Both her older siblings were riders. Her older brother, Brennan, died in the battle for Draylor six years ago. While the facts are all wrong, I'm certain in my gut that this is the story she's been fed her whole life. Her father died within twelve months of Brennan. My heart aches for her at the loss and grief she experienced so young. She spent the first six months of her life in the infirmary, treated for a condition passed to her from her mother during pregnancy. It's not named or clear exactly what happened. That's unusual. The records from the Healer's Quadrant are some of the most orderly around. She's lived in Basgiath all her life. I cross-reference against Rhiannon's file just to be sure. There's nothing connecting them. But Ethos, bingo. Their families lived right next door, so they're family friends. It makes sense. I can just imagine the family dinner gatherings. Colonel Atos sat at one end and General Sorengale the other, secret glances between Dane and Violet, just one year apart in age. Maybe they're not together, but there's a history there either way. I almost pass over the list of her assignments, where she was stationed during the school break each winter but my eyes snag on a discrepancy at the bottom of the list. Every year she spent with Markham in the scribe quadrant. Every year, until this one. This year, she spent it with Major Gilstead, training to become a rider. The change is so sudden, it feels important. There's nothing else in these files that suggest any interest in becoming a rider. And yet six months ago, bang, she's training to join us in the rider's quadrant. Without years of training, she's almost guaranteed to die in this place. Why would her mother allow it? It's a death sentence. There's only one reason that makes any sense at all. Her mother sent her here to expose us. I walk with the truth of it back to the rider's quadrant, feeling it sit uncomfortably in my gut. It's the only thing that makes sense. But it also doesn't square with everything Brennan has said about her, the plans we made or the blatant fear in her eyes. Maybe she doesn't know what she's a part of yet. I'm so lost in my thoughts that I walk straight into Garrick at the top of the stairs in the rotunda, Bodhi right behind him. They're both rebellion kids like me and have fought just as hard against the discrimination in their names as the rest of us to make it to executive officer and section leader in my wing. Zayden, we've been looking for you everywhere. Garrick's tone is accusing. I shrug. I fancied an early morning flight. Garrick frowns at me. Lies, Scale says, her voice still laced with sleep. Everyone knows I would never get up this early. We were supposed to meet to discuss. Bodhi doesn't finish his sentence, eyeing me pointedly, unable to speak freely with riders and cadets milling around us in every direction. Shit, the date and location for our first meeting with all the rebellion kids. I completely forgot, so distracted by thinking about Violet Sorengile and her motivations in all this. 
That meeting is exactly the kind of thing she could use against us. It needs more thought and careful planning than ever. As if I've conjured her with my thoughts, Violet walks seemingly out of nowhere into the middle of the rotunda. The light from the windows on all sides seems to glint off the silver tips of her hair. She pauses and then whirls around to look right at me, as if she can feel my gaze on her. Garrick says something next to me, but I ignore him, my eyes locked on Violet. She's glaring at me, her body tense like she's about to go for one of the daggers strapped to her ribs. Interesting. She's scared of me, or has a death wish if she's seriously planning to throw one of them at me up a flight of stairs with twenty feet separating us. I'm not sure even I could make that shot. Atos steps out from the same direction Violet came from. Wow, these two have no subtlety at all. I arch a brow at Violet, disappointed in the lack of finesse in this espionage. This is hardly the secret meeting of some master conspiracy with command, unless that's what they want me to think. Gods, I'm fucking paranoid. The crowd is thinning out around them as cadets head in every direction to make it to morning classes. Etos pushes Violet behind him dramatically, like that would make a single bit of difference if I wanted to get my hands on her. I already knew your parents were tight, I call out, and all the remaining cadets turn back at the sound of my voice. But do you two have to be so fucking obvious? Etos glares at me his arm reaching out like a shield in front of Violet. Let me guess, I say. Childhood friends? First loves, right? Violet whispers something in his ear. That pisses me off and my jaw clenches. Etos is nodding, keeping his eyes on me like he wants to know the second I move, as if my shadows aren't already circling them and could grab them from any direction before they knew a thing about it. It feels like an insult that they would underestimate me to such an extreme degree. Violet might not know any better, but Atos is sorely misinformed if he thinks I couldn't take him. Correct, Atos says, not bothering to whisper it back in her ear. But you're not. He turns to look at her then, the fondness plain on his face. I expected you to do a better job of hiding where your affections lie, Atos. I walk down the steps towards them. I want him far away from her. Run, Violet, now. Etos orders, his muscles tensing. Violet runs for the academic wing door, heaving it open. The intensity of his reaction confirms what I suspected. He placed her in his squad because he has feelings for her. While there's a chance this levels up to something bigger, I can no longer use her squad placement as the damning evidence I thought it was at the first formation. Just because he's protecting her doesn't mean they're colluding against me. I take my time descending, enjoying the war in Etos's eyes now that he's not performing the role of protective squad leader for his childhood sweetheart. Does he run too, or does he face me? His hands clench in fists at his sides as he stays exactly where he is. The Codex forbids me from hurting him, which I'm sure he already knows, but it doesn't mean I can't make him squirm. I stop an arm's length from him and say nothing, waiting for him to speak first. He straightens up at attention. Wing leader? I don't know what your previous wing leader allowed on her watch, Etos, but I strongly condemn any relationship with a first year under your command. I can tell by the way his eyes flare that he knows exactly which indiscretion I'm talking about from last year. Sir, the Codex does not expressly forbid it. I'm aware. I tilt my head and raise one eyebrow. I strongly condemn it, Etos. I don't give a shit what the Codex says. Fuck whoever you want in your own year. I want the first years focused on training. Soren Gale included. Understand? I sense a quiet ripple of understanding behind me on the staircase as I say her name. Garrick and Bodhi, making the same family connection as I did yesterday. Atos nods, but his lips twitch with words he can't say. He waits and I let the silence stretch out longer than is comfortable before I say, Dismissed. He runs for the same door as Violet. Thank you for watching. Let me know who narrate a voice you like better. I think this one sounds more natural if a little too old for Zayden. The last one sounds younger but more robotic. Let me know in the comments below which one you like.